Hi there, I'm Dr Samantha Engwell. I'm a volcanologist at the British Geological Survey and my expertise lies in the characterisation of explosive volcanic eruptions through analysis of eruptive products. So hello, I am Dr Julia Echen. I am a researcher at Laboratoire Magma et Volcan in France and I have expertise in the characterization of explosive volcanic eruptions through the sedimentological study of uh, volcanic uh, deposits and the physical chemical characterization of volcanic products. So with this um, presentation, we aim at providing insights into pyroclastic fall deposits, which are one of the products from explosive volcanic eruptions and at explaining how these deposits can be used to understand the eruptions that produce them. So we will start with a general introduction. During explosive eruptions, fragments of quenched fresh magma and all rocks eroded from the conduit walls or the vent are ejected from the volcano and injected into the atmosphere in volcanic plumes or as ballistics, as you can see here, on this schematic. So volcanic plumes rise vertically or sub-vertically through the atmosphere and are transported um, horizontally by a combination of gravitational spreading, wind advection and diffusion processes. So the fragmented material transported uh, uh, in volcanic plumes or as ballistics uh, is called tephra or pyroclast and uh, they, they range several orders of magnitude in size, with bombs and blocks being bigger than 64 millimeters, lapilli between 2 and 64 millimeters, ash being finer than 2 millimeters, with fine ash being uh, finer than 63 microns. So this is the classification scheme of Fisher, which was published in 1961, but which is still uh, widely used today. When uh, tephra deposit on the ground by sedimentation from volcanic plumes, they form pyroclastic fall deposits that blanket the topography, as you can see here on these two photographs, one from the Chaitan eruption in 2008 and the other one from the Rabo eruption in 1984. So fall deposits can be generated by vents derived copy DC or resuspended plumes, but in this presentation we will focus on vent derived and copy DC plumes, which are directly related to um, eruptive activity. So vent derived plumes are formed following the decompression and fragmentation of the ascending magma in the conduit, which uh, generates a mixture of particles and uh, gas, which accelerate in the upper part of the conduit and exit the volcano at high velocity in a jet. Ambient air is then entrained in the jet in the convective region where the plume becomes buoyant and rise through the atmosphere until it reaches the level of natural buoyancy, which is the altitude at which the density of the plume becomes equal to the density of the surrounding atmosphere. And so at level of natural buoyancy, the plume then spread horizontally due to gravity and then with mm, wind advection. So copy DC plumes are formed by a different process. They are related to the propagation of pyroclastic density currents, so we call them PDCs. So while PDC flow on the ground, they also entrain ambient air, which, because of the high temperature of the flow, uh, can lead to part of the flow becoming less dense than the surrounding uh, air. And this is a phenomenon called buoyancy reversal, which can lead to the lift off of part of the flow, where it becomes buoyant and rise also in a convective column through the atmosphere until it reaches the uh, a level of natural buoyancy, uh, where then it behaves the same way as a van derived plumes. So uh, while vent derived plumes transport the full range of tephra sizes that um, uh, are generated uh, by fragmentation. Copy DC plumes only transport relatively fine ash, so approximately finer than 100 micron, because PDC propagation, buoyancy reversal, and liftoff are processes that are size selective. 
So uh, this means that band-derived plumes and copy-DC plumes generate four deposits with different characteristics that will be highlighted later in uh, the lecture. Fold deposits are formed by uh, particles settling from convective region or uh, the spreading cloud, both in vent derived and copy DC plumes, while uh, ballistics are generated at the gas, in the gas truss region in vent derived plumes only. So the physical processes controlling settling from, vent, uh, from convective region or spreading uh, clouds are different and leads to different features uh, in fold deposits that will be highlighted later in uh, the lecture. So here are examples of volcanic plumes. The first photograph is the volcanic plume generated during the January 27, 2011 eruption of Shimodake volcano in Japan. You can see that the plume is bent over it means that the column is not vertical, but it is subvertical, And this is what we call a weak plume, which is uh, when the ascending velocity of the plume is much lower than the wind velocity. You can also see on this photograph that uh, you can see the particles falling from the cloud and reaching the, gro the ground where it's going to generate the fall deposit. So the second photograph is the plume generated on June 12, 1991 during the Mount Pinatubo eruption in the Philippines. And this is a strong plume with a vertical column and an umbrella, which is in the process of developing here on this photograph. Over the following slides, I will describe how we identify and describe volcanic fall deposits during field analysis. Volcanic eruptions can produce a range of deposits, each with their own characteristics. Volcanic bombs are fragments that have been forcefully ejected from the volcanic vent and follow ballistic trajectories away from the volcano. Such ballistics are common, commonly much larger than class in the associated fall deposit, such as that shown here. The process of dispersion and deposition through the atmosphere means that class that make up fall deposits are typically well sorted and that fall deposits are, cla um, are class supported with very little matrix material. The class are commonly angular, as they have had minimal interaction with each other and the ground prior to deposition. Pyroclastic fall deposits are not limited to topographic lows or valleys, but instead mantle the topography um, to form relatively continuous layers, and this makes them relatively easy to identify in the fields. Fall deposit characteristics can be used to provide insight into the dynamics of an eruption. When looking at deposits, we illustrate deposit information through production of a stratigraphic log, where changes in the deposit type, for example, fall or flow, and other characteristics such as grain size, componentry and sorting are recorded. Changes in grain size and componentry within a given section can be used to infer changing mass eruption rates, plume heights and wind direction. An increase in mass eruption rate, and therefore plume height during an eruption, is indicated by smaller class at the base of the deposit, coarsening to larger class at the top. Such a deposit is called a reverse graded deposit. Deposits also provide some information on plume instability. If fall deposits are interspersed with pyroclastic flow deposits, this indicates that the plume was unsteady and portions of the plume collapsed during the eruption. Analysis of deposit information, for example, deposit thickness or maximum grain size from multiple sites across the dispersion area, can be used to estimate the eruptive volume and plume height, and we'll discuss methods for this later in the presentation. Quantifying key eruption characteristics, such as eruption volume and plume height, require careful measurement and sampling of deposits. Estimating eruption volume requires the collection of deposit thickness or mass. Deposit thickness, or mass, is measured at numerous locations to allow spatial variations in the deposit to be captured. Over time, tephra deposits can undergo compaction, which affects the thickness of a deposit. Measuring tephra mass negates this problem, but measurements of mass can be, made, can be much more time consuming, require more damage to a deposit, and are not appropriate for all deposits, such as older deposits, those difficult to access, or welded deposits. 
Deposit grain size characteristics can provide information on fractionation and transport processes during an eruption. To produce grain size distributions, sieves, typically of one or half phi intervals, are taken into the field. Large samples are collected from the field and the coarse portions are sieved, as shown here. A split of the fine portion is commonly analysed using, for example, laser analysis, and these two bits of grain size information are stitched together to provide a distribution of the grain size of class at a given location in the deposit. Componentry analysis commonly takes place during the sieving process, whereby class of different size fractions are separated according to type, for example, pumice, lithics, juveniles or crystals. Maximum class size is a key measurement required for estimating eruption plume height. Maximum lithic size is preferred to maximum pumice size, as lithics are much less prone to breakage on deposition, meaning that their size is reflective of its original size. Different researchers use different methods and assumptions for measuring class size. To work towards the production of consistent data sets, a study by Bonner et al. in 2013 made several suggestions around, for example, selecting sample area and methodology for class measurement, and recommended using the geometric mean estimated from three orthogonal axes on the, as the preferred way to estimate maximum class size. To visualise the geometry of a deposit and the decay and deposit thickness away from the volcano, thickness or mass measurements are used to produce isopack, or isomass maps respectively. Isopack maps provide a visual representation of variations in deposit thickness. Where contours are close together, the thickness changes significantly over small areas. But where deposits, but where contours are long distances from each other, the decay in thickness is small. These maps are produced by drawing contours around measurements either by hand or through application of interpolation methods. Both methods require some assumptions and uncertainties arise where contours should be drawn, particularly in areas where there is limited deposit information. Key to production of isopack and isomass maps is knowing where deposits are not found, as this information details the preserved limits of a deposit. It is important to note that the preserved limit of a deposit i.e. that seen in the field today, may be different to that of the original deposit extent. This can be due to several factors, for example erosion of the most distal deposits, meaning that the preserved extent is smaller than the original extent, or due to resuspension of deposits by wind after the eruption, which can remobilise deposits, expanding them downwind in directions different to that of the eruption. Production of isopack and isomap Isomass maps requires quite a lot of data points, which are well spread across the deposit extent. Greater numbers of measurements at higher resolutions across a deposit allow more detailed spatial variations in thickness to be identified. Deposits can have a range of geometries, from cone-like where deposits are built up in a cone around the vent, to sheet-like where deposits have been dispersed over large distances but tend to be relatively thin. These types of geometries are related to eruption style, where strombolian activity commonly disperses and deposits class close to the vent, but more energetic eruptions can disperse class over greater distances. Deposit geometry is also related to the atmospheric conditions during the eruption, and more specifically to the balance between the energy of the eruption and the strength of the wind. Isomass isoma maps showing concentric circles around the volcano indicate an eruption where wind had little impact on the volcanic plume, while elongate deposits, sometimes with several lobes, indicate dispersion was affected by the wind. Finally, secondary thickness or mass maxima are observed in some deposits. Such maxima were first observed in deposits from the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption, where the secondary maxima was observed over the town of Ritzville. Such secondary maxima are related to enhanced depositional processes. In the case of the Mount St. Helens example, related to the formation of hydrometeors, which are clouds of water vapour, which enhance deposition of particles.
So four deposits are composed of many individual clasts, which are variable in nature, depending if they come from the freshly eroded magma or the erosion of the wall rock. So when examining tefrafold deposits, we can uh, characterize the component tree, which means uh, categorizing particles in different groups, depending on key characteristics, such as uh, their vesicularity, their morphology, their degree of alteration. So component tree analysis allow identification of particles coming from the fragmentation of the fr fresh magma, which we call juvenile particles or uh, identification of the particles coming from the erosion of the wall rock that we call non-juvenile particles or lithic particles or um, accidental particles. Note that the term lithic is also used in the literature to describe dense juvenile particles. So uh, some examples uh, of um, components that you can observe in full deposits uh, here, among the juvenile particles, you can find some scoria, which are uh, vesicular particles with a mafic to intermediate composition, which are brown or black in color. Pumice, uh, which are uh, highly vesicular particles with a felty composition, which are thus um, light in color. You can also observe free crystals, which are phenocrysts uh, released from the magma during fragmentation. And they often show a coating of glass, as you can see here on this image. And you can also observe some dense particles, which are shiny and come from a dense, uh, hence degassed magma. They are often uh, found in eruption, in full deposits from eruption where the magma had a slow ascent rate and had time to degas in the upper part of the conduit. So among the lytic particles, so the non-juvenile particles, you can observe scoria and dense particles with different degrees of alteration. You can also find some dense particles that look very much like juvenile dense, except that they show a patina and they often come from the uh, erosion of old lavas. In four deposits, you can also observe some aggregates, which are uh, clustered uh, ash particles. So some show uh, are well structured. They have a spherical form as the one you can observe here um, in a tephra layer in the outcrop. And here as a cross section of uh, image by a scanning electron microscopy. So these aggregates, well structured aggregates, are called um, accretionary pellets, and you can almost sample them as individual particles. Some other aggregates can, are much less structured and are just uh, loose uh, uh, clusters. So juvenile particles can be described by their vesicularity, which is the volume of vesicles in regards to the ground mass. So the vesicles uh, are the remnants of the gas bubbles in the magma, in black here on this image, while the ground mass in, in gray here, which is either glassy or rich in micro microlites, represents uh, the quenched liquid phase in the magma. So the number-based and size-based vesicle distribution um, can be inferred from uh, images of polished cross-section of lapilli, images acquired by scanning electron microscopy, as is the case for these uh, two images here. So the number-based vesicle distribution, called the vesicle number density, um, represents the number of bubbles per unit area, while the size-based vesicle distribution is the vesicle size uh, distribution in the particle. So both these parameters inform the behavior of the gas phase in respect to the liquid phase during magma ascent and decompression until uh, the fragmentation event. So in the examples here, the blue particle, this one here, has a medium vesicle number density and um, a relatively narrow uh, vesicle size distribution, which suggests a single bubble nucleation stage of the magma and homogeneous bubble growth during magma, as magma ascent. So the orange particle here um, has um, um, 
a high vesicle number density, and a large range, possibly bimodal size distribution, suggesting two stages of uh, bubble nucleation, with an early uh, stage which generated the um, first bubble population, which had, uh, had time to grow and coalesce during magma ascent, which are the bubbles, uh, the vesicles, the larger vesicles in this image and a late nucleation stage, which generated the numerous small vesicles that you can see here in the ground mass. Um, and these vesicles didn't have time to grow or coalesce before magma fermentation. So in addition to these uh, contrasting internal textures of tephra, they uh, also have contrasting morphologies that can be described either in terms of form or roughness. So the form of a particle is uh, its uh, aspect ratio or its elongation or roundness, while the roughness of a particle refers to the reg regularity or irregularity of um, its contour. So class morphology depends, uh, depends on the magma vesicularity and the rheology at the time of fragmentation and also the type, the type of fragmentation. So for example, smooth surfaces and elongated shapes as um, this particle here um, correspond to fluidal clasts that are generally formed by uh, fluid dynamic induced breakup in a low viscosity magma, whereby melts with high surface tension and low shear viscosities are st stretched, stretched into filaments. Um, rough uh, surfaces like these particles or this particle with relatively equant uh, uh, shape correspond to highly vesicular grains uh, formed by the brittle fragmentation of a intermediate to high vis viscosity melt. And blocky contours with sharp edges like this one or this one are generally also or often um, dense particles or crystals. So up until here, we have explained to you how to describe key features of fall deposits and tephra, and how these features are related to the dynamics of the eruption. So now we are going to explain how some parameters can be used to um, interpret and quantify uh, eruption dynamics. So first key parameter is the sp spatial thinning of fall deposits, which is the rate at which the thickness of a fall deposit decreases away from vent. So here we compare um, two fall deposits, the first one from the 18 May 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption in the US, which is a deposit for which we showed you the isopac and isomass maps in an earlier slide, and these deposits show a secondary uh, mass and thickness maximum away from vent. And the second example is the fall deposit from the 27 June 1992 Monspur eruption in Alaska. So in each case, the black uh, markers represent the thickness of the deposit at different distances from vent, and the red markers represent the mass uh, per unit, uh, the mass of tephra deposited per unit area. So you see that the thickness and mass per unit area both show a decrease away from vent, but at a rate which is different. And the difference between these two um, descriptors is in fact um, related to the variation in bulk deposit density which decreases away from vent. And the bulk deposit density is a measure of its compaction. Um, in, 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 in both examples, you, so you have this general decrease in thickness and mass per unit area away from vent, but at Mont St. Helens, you have an increase here around 300 kilometers from vent, and then a decrease again. Uh, um, further away. And so this is the um, demonstration that there is a, a mass and thickness maximum away from vent. You also see, particularly at Mont St. Helens, but also in the spur deposit, a scatter, a vertical scatter, which corresponds to the crosswind variation 
in thickness in deposits that are not uh, circle-like but elongated. So while um, here the upper point uh, represents really the, the maximum thickness and mass, so along the deposit axis, and the other points represent uh, the thickness and mass on the margins of the deposits. Alors, another way to describe the ceiling rate of all deposits is to plot uh, the isopack value, which is a thickness, so here on this axis, against the um, area enclosed by a given isopack, which is this axis here in blue, and the points are thus here in blue on both um, on both plots. So these isopack area-based thinning rates tend to smoothen the crosswind cross thickness uh, uh, variations in tetrafold deposits and are thus useful to infer deposit volumes and to compare uh, different uh, deposits. So here, what you see is that the isopack-based uh, trends provide a different picture of the thinning rate compared with plotting the thickness measurement values measured across the deposit. Um, so the thinning rates can be related to the eruption dynamics. So here we show a compilation of uh, thinning rates from various eruptions colored according to their style. So in blue, you have low intensity Hawaiian and Strombolian eruptions. In orange, you have intermediate intensity Seplinian eruptions. And in red, you have Plinian and Plinian eruptions, which are high intensity. You see that the higher the intensity or the more explosive the eruption style, the shallower uh, the thinning rate of the deposit. This means that Hawaiian and Strombolian eruptions tend to generate cones, while Seplinian and Plinian eruptions tend to generate uh, sheet-like deposits. And if you observe the thinning rate here of Plinian and Triatoplinian eruption, which tend to disperse tephra um, to several hundreds of kilometers away from vents, you see on the, the horizontal axis, uh, you see that their thinning rate becomes even shallower away from vents. You observe a change in slope here before 100 kilometers. So in fact, break uh, in slopes in the thinning rate of all deposits are observed in most deposits, and they can be related to the processes of tephra transport and sedimentation from volcanic columns, and uh, umbrella clouds. So in Bonadona et al. 1998, the thinning rate of, um, of uh, fall deposit has been related to the regime of particle settling. So a first uh, steep segment uh, can be observed in fall deposit, uh, which is related to uh, particles falling from the, uh, the, the plume in a turbulent regime. A second segment uh, is explained by the particles falling in an intermediate regime. And the third segment with a shallow decay rate is explained by particles falling in a laminar uh, regime. And the changes in particle fall regimes are controlled primary, primarily by the sizes of particles available for fallout in the dispersing umbrella cloud and also the height in the atmosphere uh, from which they are falling. Eruption size is perhaps the most important characteristic for describing an eruption. Size can be used to inform magnitude frequency patterns of eruptions and therefore is key for assessing hazard at a given volcano. Eruption size most commonly refers to the volume or mass of material emitted during an eruption. Eruptive volume or mass can be estimated in, num in a number of ways. Most commonly, isopack or isomass maps can be analysed to produce square root of isopack area versus log thickness plots, such as that shown here, representing the thickness or mass decay from source. The data can be fit and integrated using several FIPS, exponential, power law or Weibull with each fit requiring slightly different assumptions and fit parameters and producing slightly different volume estimates. 
Several resources are available to aid estimation of TEFRA volume or mass and associated uncertainties. And we've linked some links here and also added references at the end. Grain size trends provide information on both eruptive and transport processes. Fall deposits tend to show several characteristics. The grain size of deposits typically decreases with distance from source. The grain size distributions of fall deposits close to source are commonly multimodal, with different contributions representing different class types, for example pumice versus crystals, or different processes, for example deposition of ballistics, or deposition from different types of plumes, such as vent derived, or from plumes that have lost, lofted from the top of pyroclastic density currents. Close to source, the coarse particles are deposited, leaving only the finer material to be dispersed in the atmosphere to, for deposition downwind. With distance from source, the coarse mode of bimodal distributions converges with the fine mode, until, at great distance from vent, only the fine material remains. A commonly presented statistical parameter used to describe grain size distributions is the median diameter. This describes the grain size at which 50% of the distribution is larger and 50% is smaller. Plotting median grain size of a deposit with distance from source allows comparisons of trends between different deposits and for common trends to be observed. For example, Osman et al. in 2020 showed that for many phreatomagmatic eruptions, there is little change in, in median grain size with distance from source. In a 2016 analysis, Engel and HN show that there is a significant difference between vent-derived deposits and co-pyroclastic density current deposits. Co-pyroclastic density currents tend to be unimodal, with their grain size showing little change with distance from vents, while magmatic vent-derived deposits typically show a decrease in median grain size before reaching a plateau at distance from vents. Such information can be used to inform our understanding of the physical processes in volcanic plumes. Eruption plume height is a key parameter for describing volcanic eruptions. It can be used to calculate both the intensity of eruption and the mass eruption rate, a critical input for application of numerical models for simulating volcanic plumes. Plume height can be estimated from volcanic deposits using measurements of the maximum class size. These measurements are used to draw isopleth maps, as described previously. In their 1986 paper, Kerry and Sparks used particle terminal velocity and wind field information to relate plume height to the characteristics of isopack maps. They produced a series of plots, known as nomograms, which enabled the crosswind and downwind ranges of isopleths for particles of various sizes and densities to be used to estimate plume height. Several updates to this approach have been presented, with the most recent by Rossi et al in 2019 using more complex modelling techniques to produce nomograms for a greater range of class sizes and densities. A total grain size distribution characterises the size range and proportion of particles of different sizes in a deposit. Total grain size distribution reflects the fragmentation processes associated with an eruption. Different eruption types are associated with different total grain size distributions. For example, total grain size distributions from phreatomagmatic eruptions are commonly much finer than those from magmatic eruptions. Total grain size distribution is also an important input when numerically modelling ash dispersal. Total grain size distribution is one of the most difficult eruption source parameters to define and various methods have been presented to estimate this parameter. Each of these methods uses different methods to split the deposit extent into different regions, with the grain size assumed to be the same across each region. Bonadonna and Horton presented a method in 2005 where they statistically partitioned the deposit extent using the Rono tessellation method, where the geographical area of interest is separated into polygons each associated with a measurement. 
The area of each polygon is used to weight each distribution such that they can be combined to form a total grain size distribution. Resultant total grain size distributions are highly dependent on the number of measurements and their spatial distribution and the choice of the deposit extent, which is commonly not very well known. So I hope that with this presentation, we have convinced you that Tefra Fold deposits are excellent archives of explosive volcanic eruptions. The description of fold deposits allow reconstructing the dynamics of past explosive events because fold deposits features are linked to the processes of magma ascent and fragmentation and also to the processes of plume generation, transport and sedimentation through uh, the atmosphere. So this means that fold deposits features can uh, be used also for classifying and comparing eruptions. And we will finish by showing an example of eruption classification with a historic uh, worker scheme, which uses some empirical indices uh, based on deposit features to group eruptions by uh, styles. So uh, the first is the fragmentation index, which is uh, F here, which is the percentage of material finer than one millimeter in the deposit at the point where the isopack with a thickness value 0.1 times the maximum thickness of the deposit crosses the dispersal axis. And the second uh, is the dispersal index, D here, which is the area enclosed uh, by the isopack with a thickness 0.01 times the maximum thickness of the deposit. So you see that depending on these two indices, fold deposits um, group in different fields representative of eruptions with various potential for uh, creating fine particles and dispersing them at uh, different distances from vents, which was the base for defining eruption styles. Uh, for example, Strombolian eruptions tend to produce little uh, particles finer than uh, one millimeter and to disperse them at small distances from them, while Plinian eruptions can generate more uh, particles finer than one millimeter and disperse them much further away from them. Frato magmatic eruptions, Sertayan or Frato Plinian, generate a higher amount of uh, fine particles but uh, disperse them at various distances uh, from them. So we finish uh, this e-volcano lecture here. We hope that you have enjoyed it. You can find uh, references on the last uh, slide that we invite you um, to check for further information. And so we also invite you to, uh, to check the other e-volcano lecture on the platform and the next ones to come. Thank you very much.